welcome to another edition of In Focus, brought to you by the Uongozi Institute. I am your host, Guamaka Kifukwe. On tonight's program, we'll be looking at the importance of local content policy and its contribution to sustainable development. Joining me in studio to explore this issue is Professor John Sutton. He is the Sir John Hicks Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics in the UK. He's also the author of the Enterprise Map Project covering Ethiopia, Ghana, Zambia, Tanzania, and soon to be published Mozambique. Professor Sutton, welcome to the program. Thank you. So we want to just start out by understanding the overall framework. We have in Africa great interest in natural resource extraction and, and related services. And typically the discussion has been about revenue and marshalling that and everything. And out of nowhere, local content comes up. Why? Well, I think it's the other side of the coin, the second half of the story. And to me, it's the more interesting half. I understand the importance of the revenue side, of course. It's very important. But I'm asking the question, how about the prospects for creating long-term good jobs for the rising generation? That's the local content issue. It's about generating a new level of capability in local companies by integrating them into the process, thereby letting them grow and generate good jobs for the rising generation. That's why it's so important. And how do we define local content and local content policy? Well, people get uh, into all kinds of models trying to be precise about this definition, but we all know it when we see it. It means local companies that are local employers being drawn into the process as suppliers, getting integrated, getting new business from this, becoming part of the supply chain of the industry and thereby wanting to employ more people. And is this limited just to, to the particular sector? So if it's natural gas, are these companies or individuals that are just in that sector? Or? Well, people tend to think too narrowly here because they sort of think, well, gas is engineering and therefore it'll be the local engineering companies and there aren't many of these. But in fact, that's only part of the story. This tends to spread its net right across the economy with all kinds of sectors being involved from uh, service sectors through to food and drink, all the way across through engineering services and onto general business services. There are a huge range of types of local company that can benefit from this potentially. And what kind of institutional framework is then required to, to implement this kind of strategy? That's the really interesting question because the experience of different countries have has told us a lot about this. Um, we know that taking a lead at an early stage in setting up a local content unit under government that will act as a focus for organizing, for negotiating, for arranging things, and for setting up appropriate training facilities for companies locally is key. If you handle this right, the results can be extremely beneficial and you can generate far more jobs in the long term. So handling this right at this early stage is really important. And are there examples of where this has worked particularly well and, well, after that, where it hasn't worked well? Well, one of the biggest successes was Colombia. Colombia handled this process really well and the result is that not only did they generate lots of jobs, but they generated whole new local companies that are now selling their services internationally. They had very good shadowing schemes with young people who were well technically trained coming in working alongside multinational uh, industry employees and some of these people not only learned how to do the job but quit and spun off little companies of their own offering similar services to those that they were uh, being trained in, and the result is that for Colombia, it generated a bunch of new, highly successful companies in the economy. I mean, it's interesting that you bring up Colombia because we're kind of expecting you to say Norway for a second. Yes, indeed. But how long ago was this? This was about a decade ago. So there's been long enough that we've seen the benefits. And in terms of other developing countries, is it necessary necessarily to have a local content policy to ensure that natural resources really translate into economic transformation and growth? The short answer is yes. Um, 
there are some multinational companies that are actually very well disposed towards using local companies. Different multinationals have different policies, different approaches to this. Uh, some of them like to bring in their international subcontractors rather than to use local firms. Some of them actively try to use local firms heavily. But if you really want to get the maximum benefit from this, you need to coordinate it from the center. You need to have a very, well, a very highly professional team on the government side talking in a constructive and cooperative way with companies with a very good knowledge of what local capabilities are and what is realistic to achieve and understanding the proper concerns of multinational companies about having partners in their supply chains. Mm -hmm. And with a sensible dialogue of that kind, you can really achieve results. Mm -hmm. But if you don't put that kind of institutional structure in place, you'll get some of this, but you certainly won't achieve the potential. With regards to local content policy, to what extent is it a, a reaction almost, if you will, to you know, multinationals coming in and taking over the economy and, and kind of crowding out the local sector? Is it, can you frame it in that light? I, I wouldn't look at it in that way at all. Uh, this is something which, irrespective of those broader issues, is a perfectly proper and normal concern of any country exploiting natural resources. Uh, this is just part of the process, business as usual. The question is doing that business well. And, and how, what are the ingredients, as it were, of, of making sure that this is done properly? Well, the ingredients are that the government does have to take an initiative in setting up an appropriate, highly professional local content unit with people who can begin from a proper understanding of what is feasible and what is sensible mm -hmm. and have a realistic and constructive conversation with the multinational producers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you need to think in terms of bringing local firms forward. And this is a process that's well understood from other countries. You can't expect to suddenly bring in a large number of local companies into the supply chain. It's a process. It takes a year or two. Some local companies can act immediately as lead subcontractors. Under them, you will get other local companies that will become subcontractors to them. It's a sort of pyramid structure with some leading local companies at the top that get in very early. But more of them are drawn in over time. But it also requires training. It, uh, it's unrealistic to expect a local company to suddenly be able to meet standards in terms of business practices that a multinational partner would expect. So what countries that do this well do is their local content unit is the first step, and the second step is a training center consisting of two halves, business and technical. The business half of the training center brings mid-sized local companies up to speed. And the whole idea is to have a very open process, a very fair and transparent process, where companies can quite easily get into that mode of the training scheme, either for business or for technical or for both. But then they have to meet certain standards and they achieve what's called approved vendor status, sure. which means that now they are qualified to bid for contracts to supply. And that simple device immediately achieves two things. It means you have a very fair and open and transparent process where local companies can try to get into this game. Sure. But you also have rigid quality requirements that mean that multinationals are working with people that are up to speed in terms of their capabilities. And it's balancing those two things that's the trick. And in terms of implementing it now, even with this idea of this kind of almost a graduation scheme, as it were, what are the short and long term implications of, of putting in that kind of policy? Is there, you know, quality sacrifice or is there you know, are there things that you need to be wary of along yes. the way? Well, in terms of quality sacrifice, if you do it in this way, where some people can get into the game immediately because they're up to speed, but some people have a channel through which they can get into the game over a one or two year period, then you avoid that quality sacrifice problem. But in terms of your broader question about short term versus long term, what's very interesting is the way firms can benefit in the long term. Let me give you an example from Ghana, 
one of my favorite companies in Ghana. It's run by a, a wonderful man who has had a, a great career. He set up an aluminium business many years ago in his youth. He uh, ran into all kinds of problems. He shifted to a new business area of fabricated steel. He now runs a large-scale basic heavy steel fabrication business. Now he was able to get into the business right away because one of the biggest areas of opportunity for businesses is in large-scale steel fabrication. There are lots of businesses here in Tanzania that can do this. And the sheer volume of demand for that kind of thing is enormous. So he has a nice cash flow business there, but he's already thinking ahead. He already has a partner from India and a partner from Nigeria that have experience in terminal and reconstruction. Now he couldn't do that himself. He couldn't get to that stage. Sure. But by having an appropriate partner with appropriate experience, he now has credibility to get into more sophisticated operations. And I think that's a very good example of how companies can jump on the conveyor belt, as it were. Yeah. Once that structure is in place and the supply chains are working, companies can build up capabilities and thereby generate more, better jobs over the long run. So the gas sector or oil sector then acts as a springboard, as it were, exactly. and then they kind of move out. If you, were to, if you were to put it this way, in terms of a good scenario and a bad scenario, the bad scenario would be one where the gas industry is self-contained, they're using international subcontractors as their supply chain. It's isolated from the economy. The good scenario is where it's deeply rooted in the economy. The companies are looking for local partners, they're bringing local firms into their supply chains, and that's building up the capabilities of those firms so that in the long run those firms have the potential to offer more good jobs to people. It's as simple as that. I mean, the argument that's come across so far has all been you know, putting local content policy in a very positive light. But mm -hmm. Why then is there so much discussion? Why, where are the areas of disagreement and why do we see them? Well, I don't think there needs to be disagreement. I think that unnecessary disagreements arise in the area where in some countries governments have thought that it was quite easy to put this in place by simply having rules about what percentage of local content was required. For instance, in Angola, that was how they initially tried to do this. And it was only when they realized that this was not working and it wasn't realistic, it wasn't feasible for companies to achieve these percentages that they were forced to ask, why is it not feasible? And the answer was there weren't enough local companies that were up to speed in terms of their capabilities. So the Angolans had to go back and then bring in training facilities for companies which could bring companies forward. Now what I'm saying is, why not avoid that learning loop and put that in place in the first place? That's what best practice is. But is there not a sense then that you're, you're kind of, not distorting as it will, but your state involvement in the growth of the economy is, is kind of going back to where we used to be and we're now in this mode of rolling back the state. Isn't that this reversing that trend as it were? I don't think so. I think that this is a very good example of where the state has a right and proper role to play in giving leadership and acting as a catalyst. I'm not saying that this is something the state does. Indeed, most of the momentum, most of the push here is coming from the companies themselves and the business opportunities that they spot. It's very much private sector led. But the government needs to be there as a coordinator and player. For example, let's just say, suppose you set up um, a training center. How would it be financed? The answer is mixed financing. Multinationals will contribute, the government will contribute, third parties can also contribute. The key point is not that the government is running things in any kind of uh, inappropriate way. Rather, you can think of it in terms of an infant industry argument, the most respectable of all economic arguments in terms of in government involvement in the economy. What you're saying is that we have some companies that can get involved in this game, but we could have more. Sure. And the key to having more is to understand that there are some companies 
that are quite capable with a modest amount of training over a one or two year period to get up to speed where they can be an approved vendor. And we need to take advantage of that opportunity by providing the institutional framework within which the companies can do that, within which private sector companies can help themselves. So this is just good economics. What can go wrong? You, you mentioned the percentages, but are there other risks that we should be aware of when thinking about a local content policy? Um, one of the things that can go wrong is that people can do things too late. Um, there is a certain momentum that is built up in terms of the building of a supply chain. And once international subcontractors are in place all down the supply chain, there's not much room left for people. So acting promptly is important. This is something that needs to be put in place now rather than a year from now. Uh, so I think missed opportunities are the things that I would be most concerned about. Um, of course one has to be careful, one has to be realistic. You need to make sure that you have a realistic and fruitful dialogue between a local content unit and multinationals. And that requires two things in terms of the local content unit. They need to be deeply aware of the capabilities of local companies and have a realistic appraisal of what companies could play a part in this story. But also they need to understand the constraints on multinationals, the health and safety considerations, the technical requirements, the business procedure requirements. They need to be realistic in knowing that firms have to be well prepared, capable and can get up to speed. So there needs to be a realistic and hard-headed understanding on the part of people in the local content unit so that they can negotiate in a fruitful and cooperative way because that's how you get the best results. Sure. One of the concerns that has been raised in, in discussion has been on, for the local private sector now. Yeah. Uh, because there is a disparity between what is considered local in the global context yes. in terms of a Tanzanian big yes. company for us yes. or in another country yeah. in Africa and what here is considered a small company. Yeah, yeah. How do you ensure that the benefits are not felt by companies that are already quite well established within our economy, as yes. it were? And how do you bring in new players into that space? Well, there's a very good way of looking at this, which is to think in terms of that pyramid again. There will be a few local companies that will play an important role. They'll be sitting at the top of a pyramid. They will be direct subcontractors to multinationals. But there will be many local companies that come in under them as subcontractors to them. Uh, the new companies are also part of the story. People will see business opportunities in new areas that were not around before. They will form new small companies that will also come into that pyramid. But I think that having that notion of a pyramid of firms in each sector of operation is a good one that there may be one very large local company that can take a lead, but that benefits other local companies that are in its supply chain. So I think you have to think in terms of a network of companies, all of which can benefit over time. But given the capacity constraints, if we can call it that, in both the private and the public sector in developing countries like Tanzania, how realistic or how feasible is it to implement a local content policy? Well, that's a very good question. Um, and one way of looking at it is to say, where is the big impact? Where is the immediate opportunity? The first area of the economy that gets affected by this is the construction sector. Now, in Tanzania, as in many other countries, people tend to underestimate the range of opportunities. And many companies aren't prepared and aren't up to speed in terms of their capabilities to take advantage of some of the new business opportunities. If you look at Ghana, for example, the before and after photographs of Takaradi port are staggering. This was a quiet area which was suddenly a hive of economic activity. And it generated all kinds of business opportunities, many of which people didn't anticipate sure. in advance. But it, huge, it became a huge hub of economic activity. 
Now for construction companies, there's huge business to be done. But many local construction companies, mid-sized companies, will not be able to get contracts of the kind they would like if they're not up to speed in terms of business processes and in technical terms. And that's why putting in place facilities for bringing mid-sized construction companies up to speed by bringing them in as subcontractors to larger local construction companies, learning their business practices, learning their technical processes, is really important. So, yes, there are difficulties. And there is a downside. If there is a bottleneck in terms of the supply of local construction firms, then more foreign construction firms will come in as subcontractors in their place. But there will also be an increasing price hike for construction sure. within the country generally. And that's bad. Yeah. So trying to get companies up to speed in an area like construction is one of the earliest imperatives. Sure. So there's almost a phasing approach in terms of which sectors tend to be uh, impacted on as local content is implemented over time. Exactly. And this is, this is one of the aspects that people often don't understand very well. They think in terms of, oh, it'll be the engineering sector. But that's actually quite late in the process. Construction is by far the earliest to be affected. And then general business services. And then construction, and, uh, and then engineering and technical. So there's a phasing, a natural phasing, mm -hmm. that brings in different kinds of firms at different stages. I mean, with this concept now of a phasing, you could suppose then that you can create an education structure to match that kind of an anticipation. Yes. And, and you had mentioned earlier the possibility of something like a, a shadow scheme yes. in terms of yes. local staff, yes. local individuals, local companies yes. shadowing Yes. foreign and, and multinational companies. Yeah. Is there not a risk that you will lose some of these people and companies that you've invested in or protected, as it were, as a government yeah. to these foreign markets or to these foreign companies? And you've kind of not wasted, but not properly allocated very limited resources. Well, let me turn that question on its head. Um, look at it from the point of view of a private sector company. If they take on somebody and train somebody, they could lose them to one of the other gas companies operating here in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. So there is very much a public good aspect to this. Putting in place training programs and shadowing schemes benefits the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's good for the youth of the country as a whole to have those opportunities. Mm -hmm. They aren't owned by any particular company. Mm -hmm. And therefore, even though individual companies, some companies have been really excellent in other countries at introducing good shadowing schemes, helping with education and training, companies differ in their policies, in their emphasis on this kind of thing. But you can gain far more by letting the government take some initiative in coordinating activity in this area. For example, in asking about the building up of university departments of engineering in this area, government clearly has a role. Sure. But they can exercise that role in cooperation with the set of multinational gas companies who jointly benefit from having a better educated young technical workforce. Mm -hmm. So the point is that this is something where coordination and cooperation between government and the several multinationals is the obvious way to orchestrate things. Sure. And, and just as a kind of uh, a side or an additional question, if you will, and I know this slightly veers off the topic, yeah. but given this strong case for local content and local content policy, to what extent is this concept transferable to other sectors, not just oil and gas, maybe mining or you know, forestry or agriculture? Yeah. Is it transferable, first of all? Mm -hmm. Well, like a lot of things in life, the answer is, in principle, yes, but in practice, things are a bit different. Um, let me just give you a homely example from my own country. I'm from Ireland. Mm -hmm. And um, the Irish government have always wanted to try to get multinational companies to source locally and build up local companies. But if you're talking about general manufacturing multinationals, 
that's actually a slow and difficult process. And governments are often disappointed by the pace at which things can be achieved in that area. Actually, the oil and gas sector is an easier one to deal with because governments are naturally in dialogue with companies that have come to the country under these contracts. And it's just part of the natural process that there will be local content concerns. And so there is a dialogue, there is a channel through which this can be discussed and orchestrated. Uh, so actually, this is a sector in which it's easier to make gains if you take the right initiatives and set up the right structures in the first instance. And then as a, as a closing, is there anything else that um, you would like to say, as it were, on, on the subject of local content that maybe hasn't yeah, been covered? I, or... I'd really <laughs> like to come back to the basics. I, I'd really like to say that um, the reason that I think this subject is so important is that it's the forgotten half of the natural resources story that everybody is very focused on sovereign wealth funds and revenue and what you spend the revenue on. But the other half of the story is to me more interesting, which is if you can move away from the bad scenario of the semi-isolated natural resources sector towards the good scenario where the natural resources sector is deeply embedded within the economy through its local sourcing and its supply chains, then you stand to gain so much in terms of long-term employment creation. I think it's good jobs in the long term that really count. And I think that building up the country's industrial capacity through these opportunities thereby creating more companies in the economy that will be good employers in the long run is the more interesting half of the story. On that note, thank you very much for joining us on the program and welcome back anytime. Good. And thank you at home for joining us as well and we hope to see you on another program of In Focus soon. Goodbye.